Good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh, it's another lovely sunny day, summer's day. What should we do? Should we go the wiggly bends or should we go the straight way? Mm, I'll go the wiggly bends. I, I, I must say, I do prefer that route. Look at that. A can and a bottle. People throw stuff out the windows. Did you see that video I made the other day of people throwing stuff out the windows? People just throw stuff out the windows. Every year about this time we have to go around with a, look at it all over the place. We have to go around with a pair of tongs and pick up all the uh, rubbish. Anyway, how are you? Hope you're well. I'm well. Hello, here's our bus. So uh, today, we've got quite a bit to talk about today, really. And, uh, you know, I don't know, I shall probably summarise it under the heading of NHS workforce policy or something. But in fact, which makes it sound really dry and dull and boring, but in fact, it's your money, how much you earn, you know, your job opportunities, your terms and conditions. And the General Dental Practitioners Association was founded in 1954 to fight for the terms and conditions of dentists working in general practice just to give you a bit of background because they felt that the British Dental Association which well, at the time was comprised almost wholly of um, academics you see the microlite above they've just had a microlite competition over at Manston not microlite you know a gyro motor whatever it's called I think they're called auto wings or something in the, in the CAA jargon Anyway, they've been all over the place, like blue bottles. Uh, I think today's the last day, or they're all going home today or something. So, uh, yeah, so GDPA, uh, uh, you know, decided that the BDA wasn't pushing hard enough on terms and conditions. So, uh, so they started, they were set up ready to negotiate on, on pay in terms and conditions. And initially, uh, they did quite well, you know, because there was a general feeling in the dentists who were, you know, in the health service or about less than 10 years at that point that um, oh this will be some massive great lorry trying to squeeze through you know if I was Prime Minister the one thing I'd do is at, at, at the entrance to every small road I'd put a set of cast iron bollards uh, that, that dictated the maximum width of the vehicle that could go down those down those uh, roads and that would free the traffic up so much because the uh, large lorries would have to choose route. The routes that were only suited to large lorries, and not rely on the goodwill of other motorists to stop and bury themselves in hedges or back up half a mile to to let them through. You know, a lot of these lorries they can only go down these roads if they're the only vehicle on the road, and of course they never are. So anyway, I digress. So. <clears throat> So you've got these two associations, you know, you've got the uh, British Dental Association, which is a clinical and social organisation, really concentrating on the British Dental Journal and their uh, branch and section, uh, cheese and wine meetings and stuff like that. And uh, uh, postgraduate education and, um, not, you know, socialising, but uh, not really pushing too hard on terms and conditions because they don't want to lose their role as the as the sole representative of the profession and also benefiting you know from a lot of um, uh, you know the fact that human beings are social animals and so really given the choice between joining two associations one of which is a like was <laughs> quite a hard campaigning and fairly dry organization that's pushing for an increase in your an improvement in your terms and conditions and one that you know where you get to meet all your local uh, dentists at uh, some nice postgraduate centre, publicly funded postgraduate centre, I can see which one you'd probably join first, you know, plus you've got the Dean of the Dental School telling you on graduation, okay boys and girls, now you've all graduated, first thing you've got to do is join the British Dental Association. And, and, and what with the British Dental Association having a sort of a clamp on vocational training and you know to the extent that all the vocational trainees are told 
that they had to attend the British Dental Association exhibition and, and meeting, etc., etc. Um, so anyway, but that's as I say, it's all water under the bridge because the GDPA, you know, collapsed. Uh, mainly when uh, the dentistry went substantially into the private sector and and therefore to a certain extent there was no need for it you know because market forces took over and dentists now are, are, are earning you know for the most part what they choose to earn or decide to earn because they can they've got a choice you know the market the market is uh, fragmented and and there's there's a, a space for everyone whether or not people choose the right space is another thing but but there's certainly uh, space for everybody if they, you know, they, once they realise that they can make a choice. So, oh, sorry, I'm just looking at that bloke. He's got a mower very similar to mine, except he's parked it outside, which is a mistake in my opinion. It goes rusty very quickly if it's parked outside. So, well, what was I saying? Oh, yes. So, uh, what's happened is the NHS have brought out a new uh, workforce strategy. Now, this is... Uh, absolutely uh, the playbook, the government playbook of getting into conflict with your workforce. Um, now, uh, the uh, economic background is that the doctors are going on strike and, and they're called the junior doctors but basically that a junior doctor just means every doctor below a consultant. So basically doctors, junior doctors are the doctors. So the doctors are going on strike and um, uh, because th they want something like a six or ten pay rise, which is well below the uh, eight point one percent inflation rate. So it's a pay cut, really. They want what they've said is we'll be happy with a with a small pay cut, and the government said no, that's not good enough. We want you to have a large pay cut. So well, they've gone on strike. You know, I don't know who can blame them. So. Um, and that's if you that's measuring the inflation in the government way. I mean, if you were to measure inflation honestly, it'd probably be near a sixteen percent. Uh, certainly is in uh, food, you know, where you can get at least get close to the real figures. Uh, so you know, the, the, but the government's got no option. They've got to let inflation run riot. They can't afford to bring inflation under control uh, because of the amount of debt that they they borrow. They need to uh, decrease the purchasing power of the currency to the point where you know the, the people who they owe uh, billions of pounds to uh, are, are not really going to be able to buy anything with uh, with what they pay back. So the government's got it. <coughs> the government is now saying it's not going to honour the review bodies. Now they went through a period. They, they've been through three distinct periods with the review bodies. They've been through the period with the review bodies where the profession was unhappy with the fact that the government didn't uh, accept the review bodies. Um, because it put them in double jeopardy because the review bodies reduced their pay and then the government in implementing the recommendations of the review bodies uh, re reduced the recommendation again. So the professions were really unhappy with that. And then uh, they went through a period where uh, the review bodies looked like that they were going to come in with under inflation pay rises. Um, and, the, and the government then said, oh yes, well we'll definitely implement those. If the review bodies are going to come in with under inflation pay rises, then you know that's uh, that's that's we're happy with that you know because they're rambling on about the wage price spiral which doesn't exist and um, and then what happens when they realize they can't even afford what the review bodies uh, recommend in the six percent against the eight point one percent inflation they they've now say no well we're not going to uh, recommend we're not going to accept the review body re recommendations uh, you know so we're just not going to so so all of a sudden the review body they went through a period of saying oh the review body is cast iron copper bottomed independent they always say the independent review body the independent review body that that is a, you know that is the benchmark the standard and we accept that they you know plus we, we reserve the right to meddle in in implementing it but but they are the the British standard kite mark for pay awards and now they've had to do a complete 180 and say that the review bodies actually um, you know just well what what are they really you know <laughs> they just make a recommendation but we've decided that we're not going to take any notice of them anymore now <clears throat> when a government gets into conflict with a profession and a medical profession like doctors and dentists and believe me I have had a lot of experience at top level with this they, they'll have sat down around the cabinet or in committee office, briefing room A, 
or oh, was the co you know cobra the so-called cobra meeting and uh they, they said like now what can we do now what they do is they try and undermine the workforce and, and let, so let's just recap quickly right they can't pay the workforce more and uh, the workforce is going on strike and the doctors are pretty unified and they're going to do a series of um uh, strikes which are going to be extremely damaging and this is on the basis you know this is against a backlog of hundreds of thousands of people already dying and getting their operations cancelled uh, because of previous strikes plus the, the inefficient way that the NHS works so rather than do a uh, you know look at how doing things differently um, which is what the GDP always um, recommended and having like a fu fundamental restructuring and a reform of uh, the way that the NHS is, is, it works. Yeah, it's okay, matey. Yeah, just lucky that I'm not a police car. That's all I can say. Or you'll be having your cycling license revoked. Um, what they've done is they've, they've decided that, you know, they're gonna have to do something to undermine the workforce, the dental workforce. Not, not the, sorry, the medical workforce. Let me give you a bit of history. When the dentists went on strike, which was in about 1992, if I remember correctly, around then, um, the, um, the uh, Department of Health fought back. Now, you would not expect, I mean, if your receptionist said that she was thinking of leaving and working with someone else because the pay was rubbish, you wouldn't, you know, um, well, I mean, you might do, I don't know, if you live in London or somewhere, you might say, well, there's, there's plenty more receptionists where you came from. Except that, you know, if you've trained them up properly and they've got a lot of experience and know your patients, there actually aren't that many receptionists that could, could replace her without, you know, a considerable impact to your business. So, but that's the government's preferred uh, option is to treat uh, the workforce as a resource. And therefore, um, the uh, classic phrase from the review body documents was always recruitment, retention and motivation. Those are the three areas they looked at. Are enough people joining the profession? When they join the profession and they're trained up, are they staying in the profession? And once they stay in the profession, are they motivated to do the job? And <clears throat> it didn't matter whether um, uh, the workforce was, you know, we argued that dentists were not being recruited. They were leaving to go in the private sector. And so the NHS had trouble recruiting, but they would say, no, well, we're not worried about, then then they thought, they always tip the playing field slightly and say, well, we're not worried about whether or not you're recruiting enough to replace what's there. We just want to know whether you're recruiting enough to do the job that needs to be done. Are you retaining enough dentists to do the job that needs to be done? Are they motivated enough just to do the job that needs to be done? And every year, you know, the, the job that needed to be done shrank and shrank and shrank to make the figures add up. Well, when dentists went on strike, what happened was the government then decided that they were going to undermine the dental workforce. And the only way they know how to do this is to dilute the numbers. And by dilute the numbers, I mean flood the uh, job market with more of the type of worker that is proving to be expensive and difficult to recruit. So the idea is like, you know, let's undermine the doctors by flooding the market with doctors. And in the dentist case, they uh, decided to recruit dentists from a few areas. One at the time was the European Union. And I remember going across and, you know, taking part in a recruitment drive for a private company in Romania uh, to recruit Romanian dentists to come and work in the UK because there was such a shortage. But the government's approach was to um, refused to let people retire. So normally if people wanted to retire early, say at 50 or something, uh, it would go through on the nod. But for a while they said, no, you can't retire early. You, you know, we, we can't afford to lose you from the workforce. So they were turned down the applications. And then secondly, uh, they tried to get a lot more people to come and work from abroad. Um, and then uh, thirdly, they tried to get people who'd left the workforce to come back in. And these are people like um, women who'd had a couple of children and, and who were still, you know, obviously qualified but not registered. And they said, you know, why don't you come back part time, you know? And the whole idea was that all of this is going to add up to a massive increase in the workforce. And, and as a result, um, 
uh, dentist pay claims will be <clears throat> undermined uh, in the same way as that you know if house prices shoot up and you build a ton more houses then it's a case of supply and demand you know the price for houses will be less as a result of all the new house building now the mistake that they made then and the mistake I think that they're making now well, apart from the most obvious one which is that you shouldn't be at war with your workforce is that um, uh, you know these people are not necessarily going to stay in the public sector um, dentistry at the time you know all these people that came back okay well they may have made a temporary um, difference to um, uh, you know, a, a, an, in, an unnoticeable difference a, a minuscule difference to the availability of uh, NHS general dental practitioners which is what they were targeting but um, overall um, they, they didn't you know they, they were free when they came back to notice that actually terms and conditions were better in the private sector and so therefore uh, they could then uh, work more in the private sector or if they were principals and owned a practice they uh, you know they might want to uh, work in the private sector but can't because they can't get an associate and so what happens is they then get an associate that's a non-UK qualified associate or uh, someone who only wants to part work part time then they, they can then work do more in the private sector so it really doesn't work and it's it's just an extension of the government's policy of slinging money at things you know you know if you haven't got if, if you haven't got something then just buy more of it <laughs> don't, don't look at why you haven't got any of it just put more money into it and in the case of the doctors what they're doing is they're talking about uh, shortening the doctors uh, training making it more vocational training um, and uh, ah, there's the micro lights all over the place there they are look they're all over the place yeah oh, they're all over the place there's some over to the right there's one over to the left you probably can't see them because the um, resolution on the camera's not all that brilliant but I'll show you where they are they're on the left up here so they've made this massive great announcement that uh, they're going to increase dramatically the number of doctors and nurses and and also they sort of imply dentists but they've not really um uh said they've no not really given any detail on the dentists you know <laughs> <coughs> and i think they'd be wise not to because to be honest dentists have got the option which the doctors don't have which is to go and work in the private sector now doctors um, if they train extra doctors then the doctors may well go and work in the National Health Service but, but to be honest with you the systemic problems with the health service the structural problems with the health service there we are, there's a couple here are such that um, just throwing throwing more doctors at the system is not really going to help uh, in my opinion I don't think uh, I think that's just they're doing that because that's the only thing they know how to do you know it's a bit like, you know, well, I, I lost my ring up the street, but I'm going to search for it here under the lamppost because this is the only place where there's any light. So, um, <laughs> so also, uh, you know, as uh, Mrs. Angry said to me this morning, oh, well, they'll, they'll, make them, they'll make them work in the health service. Uh, ignoring the fact that universities train all sorts of professionals, you know, architects, vets. It's very... I don't know how many National Health Service vets you know. I don't know how many uh, National Health Service architects you know. But the idea that you're going to just in, in, in exchange for training people, you're going to um, require them to work in the National Health Service is, is a bit laughable, to be honest. Where it does happen, like for example in airlines, you know, you might find an airline that was willing, or well, you used to, you, you won't be able to these days, you used to be able to find an airline that was willing to put you through flying school uh, on the basis that you would go and work for that airline. And they would pay your fees and then on the basis that you they would then give you a job and, and top slice your salary until you'd paid back the cost of your training. So after, I don't know, three years or five years or something, you, you got to be a free pilot, which is great. Um, in, in dentistry, it used to happen, uh, the um, RAF, for example, one guy, uh, Dermot in my year went to uh, went into the RAF and the RAF you know covered a lot of the cost of his training even though at the time really they didn't have all this £9,000 a year malarkey where you pay for your pay for your training twice but um, 
you know, it, it can be done. It, but what's going to happen is that the NA, they're, they're going to have to say, like, for example, we will write off your £9,000 a year NHS uh, uh, university fee, uh, for, which is for five years, you know, that's forty five grand. And then on the basis that if you come and work for the NHS, we'll deduct uh, £9,000 from your salary every year for five years. And then when you've paid it back, you're, you're free to do what you like. Now, you know, there are all sorts of ways around this scheme. All sorts of ways. Any country that has re introduced a requirement to work for the state in return for a state university training has always had to make it something really ridiculously short. These, these are all the, uh, the old blue bottles on the left here. Um, has, has had to make it something really short, like a year or two years at the most, you know. And then, really, I mean, do you want a load of dentists and doctors working in the health service who, who don't really want to be working in the health service, who are just putting their time in their national service, you know, before they get a job in the private sector? Do you think that they're going to uh, be at their best for those two years, or are they going to be skiving off and watching the cricket every afternoon? You know, are they... Uh, are they the sort of people that you want to uh, are, are going to solve your workforce crisis? Um, and I, I honestly, I don't think these people have thought it through. Um, I mean, they haven't even proposed that yet. But I mean, but the, the trouble is, it's a leaky bucket. You know, you're trying to fill up the bath when the bath plugs out. If all your dentists and a certain number of your doctors are going to go into the private sector, uh, there's no point training them faster. <laughs> They're just going to. <laughs> the tighter you squeeze, the more they will slip through your fingers. <laughs> oh dear. So, you know, it's what is needed is structural reform of the National Health Service. And uh, what the government is doing is they're selling this as structural reform. They're saying, what well, we are going to we are going to uh, have a lot more doctors in 15 years mind you you know bearing in mind we've got an election coming up next year so i mean this is we're getting into desperation moves here you know they'll very soon they're going to start announcing that dentistry is free of charge uh like it used to be and it's all the sort of desperation that comes into political parties when they realize they're going to lose the election and it doesn't really make any difference what they promise because they're never going to be called upon to implement it so it's, it's a massive announcement of a big increase uh, and a mythical and, and an imaginary increase in the workforce. Something that's comforting. You know, the old uh, cartoon where you've got two desks. One's labelled uh, comforting lies and the other one is labelled unpleasant truths. And the one, the desk for comforting lies has got a line round the block and the desk for unpleasant truths is... Um, is uh, is empty, you know. Nobody's nobody's queuing up there, so <clears throat> you know it's going to make a big splash, and people are going to say, "Oh, well, okay," you, you know, fifty thousand more doctors or whatever, seventeen thousand more nurses. Great, that's what we need. But I think they're just they're totally ignoring the fact that that's not what they're going to get. I mean, that is what we need, but just saying well we're going to train more it's not actually the solution in the same way as the national health service it, always the solution is well it's underfunded it needs more funding we spend less money on it than other, other countries look you know ignoring the fact that there are demonstrably better ways of running a health service that produce far better health outcomes that cost much less money um, but which are completely ignored even though they've got a proven track record of success. And uh, we just carry on doing the same old thing. And the uh, argument to why isn't what you're doing working is always because we're not doing it fast enough or enough of it or we're not spending enough money on it. Look at that. Round the road works. Like a boss. This is, uh, this is a good example 
how to get on in life. Uh, have a better now, so have a bit, a bit of this, you know. Don't sit back there in the roadworks. Find a little shortcut that, uh, you know, do a bit of research. To fail to prepare is to prepare to fail. Oh, I knew you were coming around here. For sure, full of fencing. Of course, you're going on the building side. Anyway, it'll all be over in a, in a day or two, they'll... The announcement will have been forgotten and... What they'll do is they uh, You know, I mean, it's not that I'm against reducing the length of the dental course. I've gone on line, I've gone on record at a, a local dental committee conference about 20 years ago, probably 30 years ago, saying that uh, I think that you know, if you can train someone to be a co-pilot on a 737 in nine months, I don't see why you you can't train someone to be an associate under the under the care of a uh, you know experienced principal in nine months. You really don't need to know about aardvark teeth. So <clears throat> so yeah, good. I mean, if they're going to reduce the course, then that's great. Um, if they're going to do more vocational training, then that's great. If, if they think that uh, it's going to solve the problem of why you can't get an NHS dentist, they're wrong. Okay, nice to talk to you. Talk to you soon. Bye.